Welcome our visiting speaker, uh, Professor Oliver Freiberger from the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome, Oliver. It's good to see you here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul, and uh, for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation also to the Host Center for Buddhist Studies. And um, I was here in 2006 already, a long time ago, and gave a talk, and uh, I have fond memories of that. That was really a lot of fun as well, although we had a smaller venue. It was like a small, smaller room, so I kind of moved up, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> That's really nice. So my talk today is interestingly sort of um, more or less a footnote to um, Elaine Fisher's talk today. Some of you were there, and uh, you, will, you will see what I mean, probably, and th those who were there. So it's very, um, very uh, similar, and I think I take up uh, some, some things that you uh, talked about as well. We'll see, and we can discuss that later. So um, I have basically a very, very s simple thesis um, hopefully not too simple, as you will see. So let's start. When scholars speak about ancient India, they regularly distinguish religions. We use terms such as Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Brahmanism, Ajivikism, etc., and we speak of Buddhist monks and nuns, Buddhist texts, Buddhist doctrine, Buddhist monasteries, Buddhist rituals, Buddhist art, and so on. We do the same for Hinduism, Jainism, and the other traditions. Clearly, for most of our studies, this is not problematic at all, because over time, each tradition seems to have sorted out, retrospectively, what belongs to them and what does not. But when we focus on the boundary itself, the boundary between two religions at a particular moment in history, things become more complicated. In the past decades, uh, scholars have often pointed out that on the local level, especially in South Asia, distinctions are not so clear-cut. Many use the metaphor of blurred boundaries, and some invoke the 17th century Mughal prince Dara Shiko, the son of Shah Jahan, who is this, the emperor who famously built the Taj Mahal, who pur purportedly declared that, the dis that distinguishing between religions was like drawing lines in water. Whenever you try, the line disappears as it's been drawn, at least for those who understand what the religions are truly about. Dara Shiko was fond of the Sufi mystical tradition and believed that divine truth can be found not only in Muslim scriptures, but also in the Hindu Upanishads, for example, which he translated into Persian for Muslims to study. Clearly, Dara Shiko's view is grounded in a certain theological position, but it does capture a fluidity that is indeed very often found in concrete historical situations, not only in South Asia. But it is also important to remember that if we believe the common narrative, it was exactly his mystical approach that got Dara Shiko in trouble and eventually killed by his younger brother, the later Emperor Aurangzeb, who viewed him as a heretic. This latter view, which draws a firm boundary between Islam and other religions, and like Moses, divides the waters, if you will, is historically just as real as the mystic's confluence of the two seas, which is the title of Dara Shiko's famous treatise. As historians of religion, we are neither mystics nor apologists, Yet it is our job to classify. Where and how do we draw the line between religions? How do we determine whether a particular concept, practice, person or object is Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Jain or something else? Is there an objective criterion to determine this? Or if not, is it sufficient to simply defer to the religious actors or texts. But what if they disagree with one another? Say, if one Buddhist author declares that a certain practice was Buddhist, while another Buddhist author warns that it wasn't and therefore should not be performed. 
do we, as scholars, classify as a Buddhist practice or not? In this talk, I wish to argue that the activity of religious boundary making itself deserves greater analytical attention. I will discuss two cases that call into question common conventions of drawing Buddhism's boundary and rather suggest that we have to acknowledge a variety of boundary making activities among religious actors. I will conclude by suggesting that attributes such as Buddhist, Hindu, etc. Et may be studied as emic object linguistic identity labels but that they are in the final analysis problematic as categories for historical analysis. So that's it. <laughs> Basically. And you know, now I'm just elaborating on this. Before I turn to the cases, let me introduce a broad scheme for analyzing religious boundary making that may serve as a starting point for discussing various aspects of religious contact and encounter. It is work in progress and needs much more refinement. And I welcome any comments and suggestions you may have. So this is very basic and general, as you will see, generic. Um, I call it the LIMA scheme, which is an acronym for these five analytical categories. Location, interpretation, means, motives, and actors. What does that mean? So again, this is um, the analysis of religious boundaries, right? So the first thing is location. The question we ask is, where exactly is the boundary between our religion and their religion located, right? On the level of uh, the texts or the expressions of the, uh, of the religious actors. So what that means is that we uh, try to identify its exact form and meaning and the level on which religious people draw this boundary. For example, on the theological or philosophical level, how and what to believe and think, right? So um, the boundary between, you know, I believe in this and you don't, so that's why we are different. Regarding ethics and social norms, how to behave, right? We behave this way, and if you behave in a different way, then uh, you don't belong to us, you are different. This is the boundary in ritual or other religious practices, how to worship on the experiential level, what to feel regarding social issues, how to envision and practice communal life, and so on. So the question here is, where, where does, where's the boundary located? Right? That's the first question. The second one is interpretation. How do religious actors explain, interpret, and evaluate the postulated difference between us and them? The spectrum of potential interpretations ranges from total rejection via inclusion or subordination to fu full acceptance of the other. So this is a broad range of possible interpretations. This is directly related to the positive or negative value ascribed to the other. So when, you, when I say the other is absolutely wrong and false, then um, I exclude it Right? This is the value that I, uh, that I have, and this is my interpretation of the boundary. When I say, well, the other is sort of um, a lesser version of what we do, then it's not a total exclusion. Right? It's a different value. And uh, so some scholars use these terms exclusivism, inclusivism, pluralism for, uh, for this interpretation. Third means. By which means are boundaries expressed, interpreted, and possibly enforced? And here potential areas of investigations are, and this is just my, um, just a list that is not by no means uh, complete, rhetoric, of course, in literary products such as dogmatic and apologetic treatises, that's the most obvious thing, religious narratives and mythology, poetry, drama, other textual forms. Religious conduct in ritual and customs. Art and architecture. Political support or rejection. Right? We can think of persecution, um, patronage, and so on. These, these are means by which boundaries are expressed. We pay, I patronage one, one religion, but, but not the other. Right? So 
um, and religious law, of course. To analyze means of expressing, interpreting, and enforcing boundaries, scholars use categories like syncretism, acculturation, persecution, dialogue, and many more. Motives. What are the motives for drawing the boundary? This is often very difficult to determine, especially when we look at historical situations, because very rarely the authors actually tell us why they do things, right? So we, we can read between the lines maybe, but it's difficult. But if they are detectable, they are often, do often appear as a web of religious, social, political, and economic factors. So it's rarely just religious. It's uh, often there are other uh, factors, other aspects involved in it. The act of boundary making is often closely linked to the interests of specific groups of religious actors. So one group has a certain interest and therefore they, uh, and a certain motive, and therefore they draw the boundary. So we're at the last point, actors. Who is drawing the boundary? Is it individuals or institutions? Can we detect a plurality or an instability of boundaries, maybe, at one, in one situation? Sometimes multiple, even conflicting boundaries are drawn by different actors in one and the same historical situation. And boundaries may be unstable and shifting over time. In other words, a variety of competing identity constructions may appear at the same moment, and each one of them is subject to change. And that is the point that I want to make uh, particularly in the talk, and to think about this, uh, the plurality of boundary-making activities, if you will, that uh, show up in, in history. So I'll come back to this a little later. As mentioned before, I wish to discuss two cases of boundary making in ancient India. The first being the use of the concept of the middle way. Now I have worked on this before, and uh, I come back to this because it's so fascinating, I think, um, on and off. The term middle way locates the Buddhist religious path midway, quote, between overindulgence and extreme self-denial, between a life of indulgence and one of harsh austerity, as one recent textbook puts it. It has often been interpreted as positioning Buddhist, Buddhism midway between the practices of other, of, uh, of other religious groups, in fact, from the early days of Western Buddhist studies up until today, scholars have used the concept of the middle way to distinguish between Buddhists and non-Buddhists in the early period, to draw a boundary. Let me give you a few examples. In his landmark 1878 book, Buddhism being a sketch of the life and teachings of Gautama the Buddha, Thomas William Rees Davids remarks, the discourse, and he, you know, this is in, in uh, this quote, the discourse, namely the Buddha's first sermon, that's the discourse he's talking about, laid stress on the necessity of adhering to the middle path. That is to say, in being free on the one hand from devotion to the enerv enervation pleasures of sense which are degrading, vulgar, sensual, vain, and profitless, and on the other, from any trust in the efficacy of the mortification practiced by Hindu ascetics, which are painful, vain, and useless. This is my emphasis here, also in the, in the next uh, quotes. Hindu ascetics. The other landmark work on Buddhism of that era, Hermann Oldenberg's Buddha, published in 1882, states, what more than anything else distinguished Buddha from the most of his rivals, was his dis dis dissentient attitude towards the self-mortifications in which they saw the path to deliverance. In the sermon at Benares, in which tradition has undertaken to draw up something like a program of Buddha's activities, polemic directed against those errors of gloomy asceticism is not absent. The way which, le which leads to deliverance keeps itself as far from all self-mortification as it steers clear on the other side of earthly, earthly pleasure. The one as well as the other is there termed unworthy and vain. Almost exactly a hundred years later, 
we still find the same link between Buddhist religious identity and the Middle Way in Richard Gombridge's introduction to the world of Buddhism in 1984. He says, the Buddha goes on to characterize his own way as the Middle Way. This term came to have, uh, came to have several applications in Buddhism, but the first was to a mean between the sensual life of the ordinary householder, perhaps exemplified by the village Brahmin, and the extreme asceticism of other religious wanderers, exemplified by such contemporary sects as the Jains. The Buddhist order institutionalizes that middle way. Buddhist monks are to lead a life of simplicity, but not of actual discomfort. And many more recent textbooks are no different. For example, Stephen Berkowitz's South Asian Buddhism to 2010 comments on the respective section of the Buddha's sermon, uh, Buddha's first sermon, by saying, the Buddha admonishes the five ascetics not to embrace lives of sensual indulgence or severe asceticism. Following the middle way between both extremes sets the stage for progress toward reducing and ultimately eliminating suffering in one's life. Herein, the Buddha appears to be in inventing a new kind of recluse, one who splits the difference between the married life of the householder and the ascetic life of shramanas like the Jains. Not surprisingly, the Buddha, who taught the middle way between self-mortification and sensual indulgence, evidently de denounced the strict form of asceticism embraced by the Jains. I end this sh short survey with the second edition of Paul Williams' book, Buddhist Thought, 2012, which states, the path is described as the middle path in this early discourse in the sense that it is the middle path between what renunciates like the Buddha would have seen as the indulgent sensual way of the householder and the self-mortification bodily torture carried out by certain other renunciates. So it's all over, it's always the same thing, right, more or less. All these quoted statements have in common that they use the metaphor of the middle way for determining the boundary between Buddhists and non-Buddhists. Non-Buddhists appear under various names here, as Hindu ascetics, the Buddha's rivals, other religious wanderers, shramanas like the Jains, other renunciates. The locus classicus to which most of these scholars refer is the Buddha's first sermon, and they uh, Im explicitly or implicitly mentioned that several times. Um, now it seems, uh, it seems important to note that contrary to what might be expected from those quotes, the respective passage in the first sermon does not mention non-Buddhists at all. It reads in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation of the Pali version, monks, these two extremes should not be followed by one who has gone forth into homelessness. What to? The pursuit of sensual happiness and sensual pleasures, which is low, vulgar, the way of worldlings, ignoble, unbeneficial, and the pursuit of self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, unbeneficial. Without veering toward either of these extremes, the Tathagata, the Buddha, has awakened to the middle way, and so on. So all this passage talks about is the pursuit of self-mortification. It does not mention non-Buddhists. Clearly, assuming that this does indeed refer to those other ascetics is not far-fetched, considering some other statements in the early texts that are critical of non-Buddhist ascetic practices. But the scholarly conjecture is fairly significant here because it links the concept of the middle way to Buddhist religious identity. Or to put it, uh, um, it suggests, sorry, it suggests that Buddhists are Buddhists because they do not practice severe asceticism. Or to put it reversely, if you do practice that asceticism, you are not and cannot be a Buddhist. Then with a second move, and this is particularly interesting, this normative statement becomes historical truth. Unlike other religious groups, early Buddhists were those who followed the middle way between severe asceticism and a life in luxury. But did they really? Everyone who knows Stanford graduate Nick Witkowski's work will not be surprised when I argue that it's more complicated. 
The two ends or extremes, anta in Pali, refer to religious practices that, that the Buddha rejects. He draws a boundary between them and the correct Buddhist middle way here. But as we saw, the passage in the first sermon does not specify what the extreme practices are. Another text, the Chuladhamma Samadhana Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya, gives more details. I will focus here on the second extreme of severe asceticism. The Sutta, this Chula Samadhana Sutta, uh, provides a long list of ascetic practices that constitute, quote, suffering in the present as well as resulting suffering in the future. Suffering in the present means, refers to ascetic practices. Right? So people who do these practices suffer in the present and they will also suffer in the future, which means after death. The stock list of non-Buddhist practices, there's a stock list of non-Buddhist practices that appears a number of times in the canonical texts is, is the list that I'm talking about. These ascetic practices include the violation of rules of decency, several restrictions concerning the acceptance, the amount and the types of food, restrictions about the types of clothes, and a few other bodily practices. According to this sutta, an ascetic who performs these practices, quote, at the breaking up of the body after death, will be born in a woeful and miserable state of suffering, in the Nidaya hell. And the Buddha predicts the same fate for persons who indulge in sensual pleasures, kamesu, the other end of uh, the two extremes, right? The other extreme. The boundary between the right practice, the Buddhist practice of the middle way, and those other extreme practices could not be drawn any clearer. If you go to one of those extremes in your religious lifestyle, you'll end up in hell. As I've suggested elsewhere, when we take a closer look at the list of dismissed ascetic practices, this stock list that, that appears several times in the canon, we find surprising overlaps with the so-called dutangas, or dutagunas, which are considered optional practices for Buddhist monks. In lists of varying lengths, the canonical texts contain a total of 14 such dutangas. Of these 14, eight correspond to the abhorred ascetic practices of the other list, for which you go to hell. And you can see here um, the, these practices, four of these eight, are identical. Pangsukula, Pangsukulika, wearing rag ro robes, Abukasika, staying in the open air, Yatasantatika, sitting on the seat offered, Namachang, Namangsam, avoiding fish and meat. These are the four. Then one is quasi identical, one could say. The Dutanga practice, Ikasanika, eating only once a day, corresponds to the practice of taking food only once a day. This is the way it is uh, formulated in the other list. Ikaha, ika, sorry, Ikahikam pi aharaham ahariti. And three are very similar. Living as an alms beggar, Pindapatika, and eating bowl food, Patapindika, correspond to not consenting to accept food offered, Abhihata, or specially prepared, Udisakata, or to accepting an invitation, Nimantana. So these are sort of um, similar things, not verbatim the same, but the content uh, sounds very similar. And the Dutanga practice of staying in a cemetery, Sosanika, suggests an ascetic practice similar to wearing ceremonies in the other list, Chavadusani. The remaining six Dutangas, right, these are only eight, the, the remaining six Dutangas, not mentioned in the other list, appear to constitute, at least for the most part, forms of asceticism that seem even more radical than those on the other list. And when I say the other list, this is the list of extreme practices that is always being uh, brought up when, when they talk about the middle way and about why those practices are so bad. Quite a number of canonical passages suggest that Buddhist monks practiced one or several of the Dutangas, 
and similar, as similar aesthetic practices, and that this was widely accepted. In various passages, the Buddha, these are other passages, of course, in various passages, the Buddha acknowledges them and encourages their observation. And in the Tiragata and Tirigata, the canonical first-person accounts of monks and nuns, the Dutangas appear as very popular practices too. Nick Witkowski has shown that they were very common still in the middle period of South Asian Buddhism, many centuries after the composition of the early canonical texts. Even in today's Theravada Buddhism, the Thai forest monk tradition upholds the Dutanga practice. So this is, these uh, practices go through history probably uh, until today only in Theravada Buddhism. We're not even talking about Mahayana where things are even crazier, if you will, <laughs> in terms of asceticism, right? So this is just Theravada. Thus the canonical texts display two very different ways of dealing with those ascetic practices. One that has no problem with monks observing them as Sutangas, and one that condemns them in the most explicit way by stating that the practitioners will end up in hell. The latter is related to the concept of the middle way, which I contend needs further attention. A closer look shows that it has, the, this concept of the middle way, has a number of quite remarkable features. First, it states explicitly what the middle way is not, namely the extremes. But its positive definition, what it actually is, is rather flexible. What constitutes the middle way varies from passage to passage. One time the middle way is the Eightfold Path. Then it is the contemplation of body, thoughts, feelings and dhammas. Then certain meditation practices plus the Eightfold Path and another time entering the four meditations, the jhanas, and being born in a heavenly world. Furthermore, the negative and the positive definition are factually unconnected. There's no reason why a certain meditation practice should have an inherent middle character, or why the Eightfold Path should be a particularly middle one. The label middle way, Majjhima Patipada, is derived only from the negative definition. Speaking about the middle ma makes no sense without the extremes. Another curious fact is its position in the Sermon of Benares, the first sermon of the Buddha. Here it is positively defined as the Eightfold Path, which appears again verbatim only a few lines later as the content of the Fourth Noble Truth. So those of, the, those of you who have um, seen the first sermon of Benares, and I suppose everyone who has done an introduction to Buddhism has seen this, um, might, have, might remember that uh, the first, first thing the Buddha says is, you should follow the middle way, and then he lists the Four Noble Truths. And the Fourth Noble Truth also has the Eightfold Path, of course. The, this curious duplication in that otherwise extremely concise text may indicate that Buddhist redactors wish to link the concept of the middle way to that of the Four Noble Truths in the Buddha's first sermon. Since the redactors of the canonical text most likely paid utmost attention to the way in which the Buddha's very first Dharma talk is presented, it seems that the Buddhist monks who were opposed to more, uh, to more ascetic practices had their hands in composing the Sermon of Benares. They placed the concept of the middle way as its very beginning, making it the very first thing that the Buddha teaches. Note that it features even more prominently than the Four Noble Truths. These, in turn, appear rather unrelated to the middle way, except for having the Eightfold Path as a common component. So I argue that the concept of the middle way was used as a rhetorical tool that was directed against more severe asceticism. Its polemical and segregating power, derived from its negative definition, was more relevant for this than its positive definition, which could vary. As we saw, modern scholars normally accept this inherent distinction between middle way Buddhists and extreme non-Buddhists. But given the fact that a number of rejected extreme practices 
that are listed as opposed to the middle way correspond to the Buddhist Dutangas, I argue that the concept was used to reject and segregate not only non-Buddhist ascetics, but also Buddhist ones. Let me return to the Lima scheme, which was the basis of my analysis here. The location of the boundary in this case is on the level of religious practice, and the interpretation is exclusivistic. If you practice severe asceticism, you are not a Buddhist and go to hell. The means by which this boundary making is expressed is the rhetorical mastery with which monks in the anti-ascetic camp manage to place their vision of the middle way in the first sermon. The motives are largely unknown, except for the obvious intention to ban more severe ascetic uh, practices from the Buddhist mon monastic community. Considering the actors, and that is my most important point, the study reveals that it was, it was a particular group of Buddhist authors who drew the boundary this way. For others, the same rejected practices constituted, under the name of Dutangas, a perfectly Buddhist lifestyle, endorsed by the Buddha as well in the, t in the texts. How they, in turn, drew a boundary to non-Buddhists, we, we do not know. But a glance at contemporary Buddhism shows that it is possible to reconcile the two positions by appropriating the concept of the middle way, simply ignoring the canonical statements that condemns those ascetic practices, some modern Buddhists declare that they were, in fact, still within the confines of the middle way. So that is pretty easy because the middle way is so flexible in terms of what it actually constitutes. Um, they could say, this is all part of the middle way. A modern Burmese monk puts it as follows, and this is a quote that I got from the web um, that was translated from the Burmese by another Buddhist monk. And it says, from his very first teaching, Buddha categorically rejected these two paths that he qualified of, of extreme paths. In this teaching, he explains us that only the moderate path, the middle path, can lead us to the development of wisdom and right knowledge of reality. The two extreme paths develop on their behalf attachments and false views contrary to the mo moderate path, which enables the lessening of attachments and the development of right view. So this is all very standard. But then he says, Dutangas are not designed for superior beings, neither for inferior beings. They are beneficial for all those who are able to put them into practice. A Dutanga is not an extreme practice. It is a mere practice that enables the mind to be rapidly and easily purified, absolute prerequisite to the development of attention and concentration. But let me return to ancient India. If one group of Buddhists condemns as non-Buddhist the same practice that other Buddhists follow, how can we as modern scholars distinguish between Buddhists and non-Buddhists in this context? There's only one possible answer, depends on whom you ask. Let me now turn to my second case study, in which I look at Hindu texts. The role of the Buddha as, the, as an avatar of Vishnu. As you probably all know, classical Hinduism developed the idea, starting around the middle of the first, first millennium of the Common Era, that the great Hindu god Vishnu incarnates, literally descends, avatar, in various particular forms in order to restore the cosmic order when necessary. The rich mythological literature of classical Hinduism, known as the Puranas, has several lists of avatars that partially overlap. The most often cited one, which has become somewhat classical, is the list of ten avatars. It starts down there, uh, in the left bottom, with the fish, the, then going up the tortoise, the boar, the man-lion, the dwarf, Rama with the, with the axe, Rama, Krishna, the Buddha, and Kalkin. The Puranas provide lengthy mythological narratives about each avatara and their particular function uh, in restoring the cosmic order. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, probably nobody here, uh, it is 
it is very important to remember that each form that Vishnu takes has a particular meaning in that moment, right? So the, the cosmic order is, uh, is in disorder, and so he has to come down in a certain form in order to restore the order, right? So for example, um, the fish is needed because there's this great flood, right? And uh, so the fish is, is the one who rescues the upright people and everyone else dies and so on. So it wouldn't have been useful to come down as a boar in this, in this moment, so you have to come down as a fish, right? So it m always is related to the, to the mythological story there. And that is really important when we think about the Buddha, as you will see. The, uh, the Buddha avatar has essentially two functions, deluding the demons and criticizing Vedic animal sacrifice. Both functions do not always appear together, as they are, as we will see, not easily reconcilable. Let me quote two verses that capture these two functions well, one from the Bhagavata Purana, 8th century, maybe, the other from, from Jayadeva's Gita Govinda, 12th century. The Bhagavata Purana summarizes the first function of the Buddha avatar as follows. When the Kali age has begun, he, that is Vishnu, will be born under the name of Buddha as son of Jinna among the Kikata people to delude Samohaya, Samohaya, sorry, the enemies of the gods. The fact that the Buddha's father's name is Jinna and that he was born among the Kikatas, who we locate at present-day Gaya, does not really concern us here. More importantly, his mission is clearly stated. Vishnu descends in his incarnation as the Buddha in order to delude the enemies of the gods. The Gita Govinda verse reads as follows. You, and this is Vishnu, speaking to the poet is speaking to Vishnu, you who show a compassionate heart despise the killing of sacrificial animals that, alas, belongs to the Vedic tradition of sacrificial ordinance. O Keshava, who donned the body of the Buddha, victory to you, O Hari, Lord of the world. Here Vishnu in the form of, of the Buddha is praised for despising blood sacrifices. I will come to this, uh, return to this in a moment. In the Vishnu Purana, and this is wh what I'm uh, referring to here, and in the Puranas in general actually, the most prominent task of the Buddha avatar is deluding the demons, the asuras or daityas, who have taken control and rule the world. Vishnu assumes the form of the Buddha to teach them false doctrines, so that they abandon the Veda, become vulnerable, and can be defeated by the gods. So basically the story in the Vishnu, Pur Vishnu Purana is this, and this is a very common thing, the, the gods uh, fight with the asuras or the demons, right? So there's always this fight and the, the demons are, um, the gods are not able to defeat them, the demons get in control, get into power, and the gods um, don't know what to do, so they go to Vishnu and say, Vishnu, do something. This is not right. We are supposed to be the gods. We are supposed to be in power, not the demons, so help us. And Vishnu says, okay, let me take care of it. So he comes down in the form of the Buddha, approaches the demons, who are just doing asceticism, uh, Vedic tapas, at the banks of the Namada River, and he talks to them and says, look, don't you want to be liberated? And then uh, he talks about uh, the Vedic sacrifice and how himsa or, or um, violence is so bad and uh, how they should abandon those Vedic sacrifices and also that they should really strive for liberation and for nirvana and so on. So uh, what do the demons do? They listen to him and they become distracted. And so they neglect their rituals, they ne neglect their, their Vedic uh, rituals and Vedic sacrifices because they are really pious Hindus, right? <laughs> um, and and uh, the, the gods observe this and see that they are weakened because of this neglect. And in fact, 
it says that the, that the rites, the text says that the, the Vedic rites are like an armor. And because they neglect it, they let down their armor, the gods see it and strike and defeat the, the demons and everything is good. Right? So the gods are in power again. That's what the Buddha does, or the, the Vishnu does as the Buddha avatar. So these stories draw a clear boundary between Hinduism, or more precisely Vaishnavism, and Buddhism. Vishnu appears not only as the true origin of Buddhism, since it is him who first teaches Buddhist doctrines in the guise of the Buddha, but the Buddhist doctrines are also fundamentally flawed and false, taught for the simple purpose of misleading the demons. Implied here is that people who actually follow those doctrines today, that is Buddhists, are equally deluded. Right? The demons are defeated. It's not necessary anymore to even pay attention to these doctrines. There is no indication that a single Buddhist ever accepted the notion that the Buddha was an avatar of Vishnu, let alone that all Buddhist doctrines were false and deluding. While some scholars argue that the avatar concept was an attempt to integrate Buddhism into Hinduism, inclusivism is the term that is often used here, a close analysis of these stories suggests otherwise. Since Buddhism appears in a fundamentally negative light, it seems rather unlikely that anyone would have hoped to convince Buddhists that the Buddha was merely Vishnu in disguise. And yet, this is not the whole story. The Buddha avatar motif was also used in other boundary-making activities. According to some texts, this avatar came down to criticize and abandon the animal sacrifice of the Vedic religion. And in this function, he is widely praised. And some texts, such as the Gita Govinda, don't even mention his negative role as a deluder of demons. So this is all that is said about the Buddha avatar. Right? There's always this one verse for each avatar, and this is the one for the Buddha avatar. This is all that is said, and that is he got rid of the, the animal sacrifice, but there's no mention of deluding the demons or something like that. In fact, when you think about it, there's also a tension between the two functions. If he abandons animal sacrifice, which is consistently viewed as a positive move in later Hinduism, how can all his teachings be false and deluding? Instead of drawing a firm boundary between Hinduism and the false and heretical Buddhism, these texts purposely obliterate the boundary. The Buddha appears in a truly positive light as a reformer of Hinduism. Most likely Buddhists weren't impressed by the, this idea either, but in contrast to his characterization as the great deluder, here the Buddha avatar is a fundamentally positive figure, like all other avatars. And in yet another take on the concept, in other Puranic passages, we're back at his first role, but in a completely twisted way. Here, the Buddha, the Buddha avatar appears in the world, as you can see here, to protect from the intoxication, the pramada, spread by hordes of heretics, Pashandagana, rather than deluding demons and thus deliberately producing heretics, here the Buddha avatar protects people from heretics, from heresies, quite the opposite of his earlier function. The German scholar Adalbert Geil, who worked on this, writes, and I translate from German, quote, in a last Puranic phase, the explanation for Buddha, Buddha's avatar rank is taken ad absurdum. The idea of the delusion of demons is turned on its head. The fox is put in charge of the hen house." Unquote. I'm afraid I don't share Gail's bewilderment here. In fact, assuming that an avatar who can delude the powerful demons with false doctrines also has the power to protect from such heresies doesn't seem all too absurd. Just think of the goddess Kali who is depicted in horrific ways, in, including wearing a necklace of severed heads She's worshipped because she thus shows her power to defeat the enemies. If she's on your side, you can feel safe. We may assume that this third variant was an attempt to align the Buddha avatar with the other avatars of Vishnu, who all save and protect humanity, 
Here the Buddhas, the, the authors bluntly deny that there is a boundary between Vaishnavism and Buddhism. It's not only about one aspect, the rejection of animal sacrifice, but about the very identity of Vaishnavism. In protecting people from heretical doctrines, as, you, as he does here, the Buddha appears as the embodiment of Hindu orthodoxy. All these examples from Hindu narrative literature must be discussed more thoroughly, and the Lima scheme uh, can help for this analysis. Let me just mention here that, again, considering the last Lima category, the actors in the boundary-making process, reveals that there is a plurality of boundaries that were all drawn by using the same motif, Vishnu's Buddha avatara. These boundaries are partly incompatible, even contradictory. As a side note, as we all know, the idea of integrating and subordinating an important figure from a different religion is not foreign to Buddhism either. In Sri Lanka, where Buddhists claim to uphold the oldest, purest and most conservative form of their religion, Vishnu is omnipresent as the defender and protector of Buddhism. Here, he is not identified as a supreme Hindu deity, but as a Buddhist one just like many Hindus consider Buddhism to be a form of Hinduism. John Holt's book, The Buddhist Vishnu, provides an excellent analysis of these dynamics. So let me conclude. The two cases show that in the same textual corpus, the Pali Canon or the Puranas, we find several boundary-making activities that are partly contradictory. In the Pali Canon, a boundary between Buddhists and non-Buddhist ascetics is drawn by using the concept of the middle way. According to this view, certain ascetic practices are extreme, are observed by non-Buddhists, and result in rebirth in hell. This stands in contrast to the view that those very same practices may be beneficially observed by Buddhists under the label Dutangas. According to this view, those ascetic practices are not used for determining the boundary between Buddhists and non-Buddhists. The second case study showed that there are some passages in the Puranas that depict the Buddha Avatara as teaching false doctrines in order to delude the demons. They thus declare, by implication, that all Buddhists who follow these doctrines are misguided and heretical. The boundary between Vaishnavism and Buddhism is firmly established. Other passages integrate the Buddha by claiming that his avatara task is to abandon Vedic animal sacrifice, thereby making him, him a reformer of Hinduism, which is a different function. And uh, the boundary is drawn in a different way. It is not clear whether this is supp supposed to say anything about Buddhists, but if so, they are viewed as Vaishnavas. Yet, another, uh, Purana passages, yet other Purana passages present the Buddha avatara as a protector against heretics and thus as a defender of Hindu orthodoxy, flatly denying the existence of a boundary between Buddhist and Hindu, and Hindu doctrine. Whether the plurality of boundaries in these sources is caused by the variety of interest groups among the authors or by historical development or both, is hard to determine and not crucial for my primary question in this talk. And this question again is, how do we as scholars distinguish religions in ancient India? Let me offer the following thought. I concur with Jonathan Z. Smith that the term religion in the singular is a second order category, a term created by scholars for their intellectual purposes and therefore is theirs to define. That's a quote by J.C. Smith. It's created by scholars for their intellectual purposes and therefore theirs to define. In contrast, the terms that we use for specifying religions in the plural, terms like Hinduism or Buddhism or Vaishnavism, are not ours to define. While scholars often use them as if they were purely second-order categories, they are, in fact, fully contingent upon the boundary-making of religious actors, 
when we use the terms Buddhist or Hindu, we ascribe identity by privileging and generalizing one particular boundary construction. It is possible that this particular boundary is disputed within the tradition. That's the point that I want to make. As we saw, when, when scholars declare that Buddhists in ancient India shunned the extremes laid out in the, in the concept of the middle way and claim that this dis distinguished them from non-Buddhists, they suppress a strong voice in the early Buddhist texts and effectively deny an entire group of monks their Buddhist religious identity. That is fine for Buddhist monks, Buddhist authors, but it's not fine for scholars. They cannot do that, I think. And when scholars state that the Buddha Avatara stands for, stands for a reform movement in Hinduism that intends to integrate Buddhism with its stance against Vedic blood sacrifice, as we often see, they ignore the Avatara's role as a deluder who teaches exclusively false doctrines. And to complicate matters even further, for many religious actors in history, drawing a boundary between their own and a different religion is not so relevant. These actors simply don't care. We find this very easily when we look at the veneration of deities and saints in contemporary India, people that we would normally compartmentalize as Hindus, Jains, Muslims and others attend the very same temple festivals and worship the same deities. The third mentioned concept of Vishnu's Buddha Avatara may be in case in point two. By viewing him as a deity who can protect against heretics, the authors don't care about the boundary between Vaishnavism and Buddhism. They care about practical protection. So again, I contend that while speaking of Buddhists, Hindus, Jains in ancient India, we rarely take into account that at any given moment in religious history, there may be various competing demarcation activities at work, and that these, furthermore, compete with a position that is uninterested in boundary making. Thus, I suggest that we avoid making historical claims about what is Buddhist, Hindu, Jain, etc. These terms are unstable and therefore obstruct rather than facilitate historical, an, an historical analysis. Note that this is quite different from saying, as Dara Shiko allegedly did, that boundaries between religions are like lines in water, that they cannot be drawn. Boundaries are drawn all the time in the history of religions. The point that I want to make is that scholars of religions should not be in the business of defining what does and does not belong to a particular religious tradition. Rather, they should study the boundary making of religious actors in its various forms, which tells us a lot about how they envision their religion, about identity formation, and about religious plurality. That should keep us busy, I think. Thank you. <laughs>